and welcome back to the Pitt UN Summit Live studio. I'm your co-host Kip Dooley. And I'm Renee Cummings. And we're now to our final segment here in the studio at the Pitt UN Summit at San Jose State University. It's gone by in a flash. We're really excited to have uh, a number of people joining us in the studio today to talk about publications, products, and programs from across the public interest tech ecosystem. So first with us today is Amy Yaboa Kwarkume, who is a professor at Howard University um, and a brilliant scholar and writer. And we're so lucky to, to have Amy here um, talking about a new special issue on public interest technology. And so it's a, a first of its kind academic publication for scholars to publish their work around public interest tech. So Amy, tell us a little bit about the journal um, and kind of what the, the main focus is and, uh, and some of the, the interesting articles that you got to solicit and edit as guest editor. Thank you. Um, it's definitely been an honor to be to leading this effort. Um, having a space for the work that's already been done for years um, has been great. Um, in the Journal of Special Issue Jigs, uh, we have scholars who are writing about disabilities, ed tech, um, trust and privacy, uh, health, and all the ways in which the Pitt UN family has been working to make sure we bring change to the public. And the public is a very complex and diverse space. So just being able to have all these journals, case studies, articles, we have a special interview with uh, Natanya Sweeney and her coming to the field and her, her own personal story in being a part of Pitt. Um, so that kind of helps us understand the need for more work to be happening. But this, spa this space is for academics, for scholars, for nonprofits, for students to have a space to have these conversations and have this um, legacy that's written down for other scholars to also begin to build in this space. So creating a space for Pitt um, alongside, uh, alongside the convening um, helps the field move forward. And um, I, I should have said in, in the intro that it's, it's from, uh, uh, the journal is called the, the Journal on Integrated Global STEM, or JIGS. Yeah. Um, we're gonna have our producers drop a link in the chat the, the journal's now live for the mm -hmm. first time. It's been like over a year of work pulling this all together, <laughs> yes. so it's really exciting. Yes. Uh, the, the journal editor-in-chief is named Robert Kruger. He's at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and the, the journal is a collaboration between WPI and a German publisher called De Gruyda. So we're just thrilled to have this, this new venue for, for Pitt scholars. Yeah, so for up-and-coming academics, you now have a space for you all to kind of put your work in. For tenure, for transferring different languages, different countries, there's also a journal on inter um, international development around Pitt and AI. So again, we want to create the space where the field can continue to grow. Without that written space, we see that um, faculty can't extend the boundaries of their work. It's really exciting, and, and there's a, another venue that we're going to talk about here with uh, with Raymar Hampshire from Braid. So, Raymar, tell us a little bit about Braid um, as a, an online storytelling and community building yeah. platform. W what is it like, and why was it built, and what can folks expect to find on Braid? Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for that uh, question, and it's been a pleasure being here at the Pitt Summit. Um, so, Braid. So, Braid. It's a educational tool and open access platform that uses storytelling to promote social learning in and outside of the classroom. Um, and so we're really just trying to create a space for students uh, to express themselves on different topics, um, share really the wisdom and insights that they have. I think a lot of times we think of students as these vessels that we teach and we sort of pour into, uh, but really uh, putting them into position as being the teacher themselves by sharing parts of their lived experiences. Um, and so Braid, um, it's been, a wonderful journey, and certainly uh, Pitt UN has been, you know, great partners uh, in, on this journey. Uh, but it's all grounded in research. Um, so we borrow a lot from folks like Patricia Hill Collins, a uh, black feminist scholar, um, this idea of the importance of marginalized communities and oppressed communities self-defining who they are, mm. right, before we're self-defined, because we know that if we don't do that, we will be self-defined. Um, so self-defining who we are, um, and then also understanding black feminist thought, like what we learned from that, um, epistemology around that. Like there's things that, that we know and we feel in our bones, right? Because we experience and interact with systems of inequity, right? And so black feminist theory and it has been sort of the foundation, the anchor for everything that we do. We, we draw a through line from that research to braid. Um, and then the last, when we self-define, uh, we share our lived experiences, and we're in community with each other, um, we tap into connected knowing, right? This idea that we're not so dissimilar from each other, right? Um, and so I, you know, I'm really big on um, 
this idea that subject matter experts bring their experience, um, but then also people who have expertise in their own lived experience, um, and really putting these two, seg these two kind of groups on the same playing field. Um, and so that's what Braid is. We've been using it um, with professors, with their students, to engage them to sort of break down some of these theoretical concepts that they're learning in class and relating these concepts to students' lived experience. And so the open access aspect of Braid is that, yeah, learning should be open, right? You shouldn't just be confined by the learning that happens in your four, on your four walls, but students everywhere should have access to knowledge, right? And so that's the public interest part about it. And so, yeah, just really thrilled uh, to, to be able to share more about it. And yeah, that's great. You know, a critical aspect of what we do when it comes to our public interest technology is really solving problems. Mm -hmm. But it's also about building products. And this is mm -hmm. why I'm so excited. You creating, Amy, the space for, for academics to really put their work out there and to be uh, really recognized and uh, respected and to also have that track to tenure, which is so critical in the work that we're doing. And of course, uh, yours is totally exciting. Uh, Patricia Hill Collins, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. You know, you're exciting me right there with that, all that <laughs> black feminist uh, uh, energy that you're bringing into the space. Let's talk about building, about building, and why building models and building products are so critical to public interest technology. Yeah, I would say um, definitely creating space and building. Uh, we know that we're being combated with the public interest being put to the side. So I think us putting the public interest at the center um, in the uh, I'm in the academy in K to 12 for our children to feel excited about creating their own technology, but also with our students. Um, Pitt UN uh, supported our Howard students with a net app scholarship. We have 10 students who will be given $10,000 scholarship this year to be able to explore their tech for change ideas, um, and that empowers students just to not only create their own. Um, ways in which they wish they see tech, but also be empowered to take those um, visions to higher ed or maybe to uh, startups, right? So just having that space that Pitt UN cr um, creates with seeds, right? We hope that we will have a forest of space for people to create their own products. I really love this question. Um, you know, what excites me most about sort of building public interest technology is the students and sort of what they get out of it. I, I get really excited about building teams. Like if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, I would be a coach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I think you are a coach. You are, yeah. <laughs> like everyone has a role. Everyone can be a star in their role. I think for us working with students, it's been about understanding what we're building. We're building a social technical system. And so there's a Venn diagram, there's the social aspect of it, and there's the technical side. And so, you know, we bring in students from different disciplines, um, but specifically our students from School of Information and College of Engineering, uh, the first thing that we do is we ground them in research. We ground them in the social, cultural aspects of our product. Um, and then we get to the fun stuff, the cool stuff later where they can actually code. Uh, but I think a lot about process. I think a lot about team building. I think a lot about how do we reimagine uh, our relationship to the folks that work with us, right? Uh, so we don't produce the same extractive uh, technology and companies that we see, right? But like, I think we have to reimagine, you know, an entire like labor practice around this. And so I think public interest technology has given us a lens to and space to be able to think critically about that because it's not just the product, it's everything that goes in, it's the whole supply chain to get to the product. And so process is something that definitely um, I care about and so this space has, has allowed us to be patient. Mm. You know, this, you know, building products outside of this academia, outside of Pitt UN, there's this pressure to sort of fail fast, right? Get to market, test, get there, like kind of skip out on a lot of the relationship building, right? Bringing people along on your product journey. Um, but I like to say, you know, building within academia, it's been about succeeding slowly, right? And so, I think when we, when we can do that, we can be more intentional about, you know, how are we um, building with communities? And I think by doing that and building that into our process, we can have better and more inclusive products. Right, right. I, I want to end, um, we, we, we only have a, about a minute left, um, but end on a, a, 
a, a very sad, tragic, but also hopeful note, which is um, to acknowledge the, the loss of a, a dear colleague of ours named Dr. Kevin Harris, who was at Stillman College, um, did fantastic work, especially around building cybersecurity clinics. Mm -hmm. yes. And so, Raymar, you got to know Kevin a little bit through, um, through your interaction on Braid, where he shared some of his stories. So I'm wondering if you could um, just share a little bit about what Dr. Harris um, uh, shared through Braid and, and what you take from his story. Yeah, I mean, I think about Kevin a lot. Um, his legacy is 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 you know speaks for itself. But you know, when I think about our conversations, we talked a lot about while we're building products, public interest technology, we simultaneously have to think about how are we securing them, especially when we're talking about building products that are specific specifically for marginalized communities, underserved communities, because we know the history of what happens when our communities thrive, right? There's all kinds of history around that. We don't, so the pillaging, the destruction, um, you know, all of these things. And so literally, like, we, we need to be leading in some ways with cybersecurity. I know it's really cool and fun to sort of get into, like, the use cases and to kind of think about user experiences but we also need to have the resources and, and fund, funding to, to, to build safety nets and safety guards around this. Um, and so, yeah, that's, when I think about Kevin's legacy, I think about uh, cybersecurity being at the vanguard of product development within public interest technology. Yeah, that's great. Well, Amy and Raymar, thank you so much for, for joining so much. us. Folks, you can uh, see the link in the chat to the new special issue on public interest technology, and I also encourage you to go to, is it braider.io? You got it. braider.io to learn more about Braid. Thank you. Thanks thank so much, you. Amy. Thanks, thank Raymar. Thank you so very yeah. much. Take care. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll yeah. take the mic from yeah. you, too. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so we have one more segment here, which I'm really excited about. Uh, we're going to have uh, Sylvester Johnson and um, Ann Cleveland come and join us up here. So come on up, folks. Um, this is our final segment for the Pitt UN Summit live studio. Um, Sylvester is uh, a rock star. A rock star in so many <laughs> ways. I don't even know where to start talking about Sylvester. Come on in. Um, you can hold the mic here. Just, yep, right about there is perfect. Um, Sylvester has been um, an academic researcher, an author, an administrator, and leader, and now a startup founder. Yeah. So you've, you've founded this new venture called the Corporation for Public Interest Technology. So tell us a little bit about, about CPIT, how it started, and, and what you're looking to do. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, both of you. Glad to be able to talk about this. Really excited to be here at the conference. Uh, so the Corporation for Public, Te Public Interest Technology is a uh, very new enterprise. Uh, so it's a startup that is a public benefit company that was started by my co-founder, Bill Ingram, and I uh, very recently. Uh, we are very much a uh, product of the Public Interest Technology University Consortium. We've been engaged with the consortium for a few years. And our launch, our emergence, uh, is happening very much through engagement with Pitt UN and very much as a product of Pitt UN. Uh, we've been able to do some early work to really uh, develop how we want to execute on our mission. And that mission as a public benefit company is focusing on harnessing the potential of technology in ways to create products and services that can advance social justice, that can bring more accountability to communities and highly vulnerable populations. And that can create a way for us to have technology that is accountable to our institutions of civil society, to democratic outcomes. So it's a really, really I think, a terrific moment for the consortium, uh, we're really excited about uh, the possibilities that lie ahead of us. That's fantastic. Um, Anne, I'm going to ask you to uh, introduce yourself and the work you do at the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity and, and also the Consortium of Cybersecurity Clinics that Dr. Kevin Harris was such an integral part of. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. And you can actually hold the mic a little lower. Oh, yeah, right about there. Does that work? Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Hi, everyone. I'm Ann Cleveland. I'm the executive director of the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity at UC Berkeley and also the co-chair of uh, an organization called the Consortium of Cybersecurity Clinics, which is now a global network of nearly 40 cybersecurity clinics that are training students in real-world cybersecurity problems while providing pro bono cybersecurity assistance to small organizations that could not otherwise access cybersecurity services. 
That's wonderful. And so what are, uh, what kind of work do students get to do through the clinics? Like are they working with uh, businesses or nonprofits or some mix thereof? Students are working with uh, any, any organization we might define as a resource that is a organization that is under-resourced in cybersecurity. Um, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, sometimes refers to these as target-rich, resource-poor organizations. So think about um, a mom-and-pop small business in your community. Think about a small dentist's office or um, a small municipality maybe with 8,000 citizens that doesn't have an IT department. Um, or nonprofits that are providing critical social services in our communities like healthcare and mental health or homelessness services. So, you know, go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask Sylvester, you know, the, the work you're doing with CPIT is uh, trying to bring more public interest technologists uh, into collaboration with the private sector. So, Ann talked a little bit about um, those organizations like nonprofits or local businesses. What opportunities are you finding in the private sector mm -hmm. for PIT practitioners to um, help businesses uh, be more responsive to, um, to the public interest and, and be responsible stewards? Yeah, uh, great question. I think the, what's really foremost for us <clears throat> as we're going to market with our first set of products and services is the AI ethics space. Mm -hmm. and, and that involves uh, both providing a framework at, at a very operational level for organizations and companies to have a policy to govern internally how they're using AI. Uh, lots of organizations may have something like a data policy, but most don't have an, an AI policy, and so we're able to help create that for them and also provide a customized roadmap for how they can incorporate AI into their operations and workflows in ways that is accountable to uh, their mission and values to some ethical framework that's, that's not just a minimum of what's legally permissible, uh, but also that's deeply engaged with what's gonna be most helpful and helpful for uh, their organization and for communities that could be harmed by misuse of these technologies or, or less than rigorous use of those technologies. Uh, I think that's particularly the case for organizations that are uh, nonprofits that, that are revenue constrained there are real opportunities to provide guidance to those organizations so that they can benefit from some of the efficiencies and advantages that uh, certain AI products can bring, while also helping them to avoid things that are not gonna be helpful or that might inappropriately expose their information and, pr and create vulnerabilities for them. And they need to be able to benefit from these technologies. So a lot of the, the coverage that we see about AI rightly it helps to point attention to its harms. I think one of the omissions is that it makes it more difficult for smaller organizations, uh, particularly nonprofits, to understand how they could actually benefit. It, it might just scare them away when in, in many ways uh, they are most in need of being able to figure out how they can control some of their costs, how they can maintain their teams the, the, of the people who are inside their organizations and even invest in those teams so that they can be uh, more more robust and resilient as that organization is trying to expand their impact. And so I think that's just an example of what we're finding early on, that there is a need for these mission-oriented organizations to be able to, to strategically benefit from this technology and to help them to do that in alignment with their mission. You know, what I'm hearing are public-private partnerships okay. that are so critical to the work that we're doing. I'm also hearing that we need to reimagine business models, uh, and that is also so critical. So, so tell me, when you're thinking, I mean, I would say, when it comes to my life, from the minute I wake up, I need cybersecurity. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that I do requires cybersecurity. But let's talk about reimagining business models and bringing the public and the private together. Great. Yeah, thanks so much for asking, and thanks for this opportunity to announce a sneak preview here okay. at the Pitt UN Summit of a report we're publishing next week on that very topic about the kind of mutual aid that cities and nonprofits can provide in order to improve the cyber resilience of nonprofits in our local and regional communities. And speaking of public-private partnerships, I want to give a huge shout out to the city and county of San Francisco who approached 
us at UC Berkeley because they wanted to have a beneficiary led hear from the beneficiaries who are the nonprofits in this local region about what were their obstacles to having effective cybersecurity and cybersecurity resilience and what was their relationship with local government and how could we leverage both of those things to improve the resilience of the entire community. Excellent. Sylvester, yourself. How are you reimagining business models with this new corporation? Yeah, I, uh, one of the things, so we, we produced a landscape survey of the public interest technology space broadly. And one of the things that uh, we're doing just in terms of it helping in a coordinated way more social justice tech stakeholders to coordinate their work so that together we can be more effective in offering products and services that can be an option for, uh, for organizations, companies, individuals to procure so they can get better outcomes. Uh, in other words, the, the commercialization space should not be seen as something as, a, oh, those, that's for those companies, they're just gonna make a lot of money, they're not really concerned about these ethical considerations. There are lots of people in organizations that have this commitment to social justice and they need to be in that commercial space. Uh, the, the other is, we're a public benefit company, and so our charter actually requires us to produce a public benefit. Uh, we're also exploring ways to coordinate with other stakeholders so that we, we can create business-to-business -business relationships that might be more cooperative in the way that the value that gets created through those services can, can be owned and shared, and that there's more accountability to creating things uh, like resources for communities. So that, that's a space that's in front of us that we're eager to explore in partnership with other organizations so that as we advance these business practices, as we launch these commercial enterprises in the PIT ecosystem, that we're bringing that creativity and imagination to the different ways it can, it can happen. Excellent. And so um, just before we wrap up, um, for folks at home who are watching, how can they learn more about the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity or the consortium and also uh, CPIT? Thank you. We are at cltc.berkeley.edu, uh, and next week on November 19th, you can find that new report that I mentioned on cities and nonprofits. Um, cybersecurity is a team sport, <laughs> and cities and nonprofits share a lot of the same mission. Um, so please go to our website and check out um, what we can do about the fact that 85% of nonprofits say that they have experienced a cyber attack, and their um, IT staff, uh, or their staff outnumbers their IT staff by a factor of 96 to 1. Oh, boy. Um, so we need more cybersecurity people. We need more cybersecurity people. <laughs> yes, people. Yes, yes, absolutely. And Sylvester? Yeah, they can go to CPIT PBC. Uh, so CPIT PBC is in public benefit company. CPIT PBC dot com. And you can check us out and uh, read about our mission and how we're trying to move things forward in a more equitable way. And your new landscape report. Yes, that yeah. you can also read that landscape report that's there. So congratulations, so, both of you. Fantastic. Thanks, Sylvester. Thanks, Anne, for being with us. Thanks for having Thank us you. on. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you can just step off. Yeah, great. <clears throat> um, well, wow, Renee, wow, wow, here wow. we are. <laughs> that was a whirlwind. Um, so many ideas swirling about. Um, I'm curious uh, as we start to wind down the summit and head into our final sessions on the main stage, exploring pit business models and also investing in the future of public interest tech, what are some of the big ideas that you're taking away um, that you're really excited to bring into your work when we, uh, we, as we head home? Always imagination, mm. love it. Innovation, we've got to innovate. We've got to stretch the imagination of innovation. Everything we've heard today is about inclusion. How do we include uh, the intersectionalities and interdisciplinary? So very critical. We had four I words. Four eyes. I'm trying Did to you just like come I'm up on, with that? I'm Sesame Street, right? This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know, uh, the pit model is brilliant. In our last conversation about products, we need to build products. We need to deploy these models. We need to have those other intersectionalities and partnerships, public-private partnerships, are critical to pushing this movement forward. And of course, global. We've got to include our global partners. We've got to bring everyone into this conversation. And the other thing that I just love is Andrine's commitment, motivation, and her energy 
that she brings into the space. And of course, I just love you in this fantastic <laughs> outfit. Thank and I you. think our next gig has got to be, what is it, the Oscars? I think so. <laughs> is anyone looking for talent? We've got, we've got a dynamic duo. We are, we are a package, though. Okay. We come together. We come together. Yeah. Right. Um, so thank you so much for joining us here on the Pitt UN Summit Live studio. We have a few more sessions left on the main stage exploring public interest tech business models and investing in the future of public interest technology, followed by a very special closing fireside chat with Andreen Soli and Katie Siegel from the Siegel, or sorry, Katie Knight from the Siegel Family Endowment. Um, this has been a wonderful way Thank to celebrate. Thank you so very much as well. Yeah, it's been a wonderful way to celebrate the first five years of Pitt UN. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved with Pitt UN or public interest technology more broadly, you can visit pittcases.org. That's our website. We're always looking for uh, new organizations and people to partner with, whether you're in academia, civil society, government, industry, if you're a student, if you're a practitioner, we want to hear from you, um, and we want to find ways to partner together to um, create and uh, deploy and govern technology in a way that really serves all people in all communities. And I just, of course, want to thank the University of Virginia for giving me the opportunity for the last three years to co-direct our Pitt Initiative, uh, which I'm really committed to, and uh, we really have some great things coming, and I know our partnership with you at uh, uh, Pitt is going to be a, a solid one that we continue to fortify every year. Absolutely, and lastly, a huge thank you to San Jose State University, to President Cynthia Teniente Matson, to Sela Galia, Michael Meth, and all the folks who made this possible. Um, thank you so much for being with us here on the Pitt UN Summit Live studio, and we'll hand it back to the main stage for our final programming of the summit. Thank you. Thank you.